Believe it or not, Facebook is still a $500 billion company. Billion with a B. And despite all the censorship, algorithm manipulation, bogus fact checks, and other nefarious activity the company's engaged in, most people's parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles may never leave because they don't see the significance of these issues because they're just using it to keep up with friends and family like it was originally designed for. It's still the third most visited website in the world. Google, YouTube, and Facebook are the top three. But a lot has changed, obviously, over the last nearly 20 years it's been online. Yes, it's been that long. In 2004, for Harvard students, then other schools and other students with a .edu email address, and then in 2006, it opened up for everyone. And as a media analyst, I think it's important not to forget how the big tech platforms used to be when they first started and to remain aware of all the ways in which they have changed. For well over a billion people, Facebook became the family photo album, their contact list, and even their diary of sorts. Its dominance made founder Mark Zuckerberg the youngest billionaire in history at the age of 23. For those naive enough to fill out the entry boxes when they first signed up for Facebook, the company knows not only who you're friends with, who you're dating or married to, as well as when you break up or get a divorce, but also which TV shows, movies, music you like, which restaurants and businesses you visit, which cities you travel to, where you work, your birthday, your personal interests, hobbies, and more. It's free because you are the product and your personal data is what you are trading in exchange for using Facebook. Many millennials and Generation Z kids either quit Facebook or never signed up and prefer Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, and Snapchat because they don't want to be on the same social network as their parents. And despite the endless scandals about abusing users' personal information and all the censorship, Facebook hasn't gone the way of MySpace, at least not yet, and remains one of the world's top social media networks and is one of the top 10 largest companies in the world by market cap. While people use Facebook for various reasons, like keeping in touch with friends and family, many use it to share news stories and videos about political issues. But it wasn't until after the 2016 presidential election that Facebook saw this as a problem. As you know, the Democrats largely blamed Facebook for Hillary's loss, citing the spread of supposed fake news about her that they claimed had caused people to see her in a negative light and not vote for her. Hillary was supposed to pound the final nails in the coffin of the United States of America and usher in the New World Order for her globalist puppet masters, but Donald Trump canceled those plans. The warmongering neocons in the Bush administration, followed by the charismatic Marxist Barack Obama, had set the stage, knocking out most of the legs from under our once great republic. But the election of Donald Trump in 2016 changed everything, and he began to right the ship. The scheming globalists were furious, the very tools that Facebook had proudly created so people could share information with others were now seen as a problem because they disrupted the traditional channels of distribution that were controlled by major media companies. If anyone posted a message, a link, a photo, or a video, that post could be seen by as many people who read the New York Times or watch the NBC Nightly News from other Facebook users simply clicking the share button. But all that had to change because the Russians had supposedly posted fake news about Hillary Clinton. Rob Goldman, vice president of the ads department in Facebook, admitted that, quote, the majority of the Russian ad spend happened after the election. We shared that fact, meaning with the media, but very few outlets have covered it because it doesn't align with the main media narrative of Trump and the election. He was reprimanded for revealing the truth and Facebook would go on to completely change the way that their platform functioned under the guise of stopping fake news. Before Facebook, people used to bookmark their favorite websites on their internet browser and would use that list to navigate their news sources, but Facebook and Twitter have largely replaced browser bookmarks and by weaseling their way in between news sites and their readers, it's Facebook, not the user, who are now in control of the articles that people see. Most people used to assume, and many probably still do, that if they follow certain accounts on Facebook, they're going to get posts from those pages in their news feeds. But the algorithms detect keywords and posts and identify the source of links and 
Facebook's proprietary technology throttles the reach of content that they don't want people to see and often limits the reach of posts so that they only show up in a few people's feeds. Facebook even patented technology to shadow ban people so that they could prevent certain posts from being seen by others without giving any indication to the person who posted it that such censorship was occurring. Yes, they literally patented shadow banning. The abstract on their patent explains the process saying, quote, the social networking system may receive a list of prescribed content, a fancy term meaning forbidden, and block comments containing the prescribed content by reducing the distribution of those comments to the other viewing users. However, the social networking system may display the blocked content to the commenting user such that the commenting user is not made aware that his or her comment was blocked, thereby providing fewer incentives to the commenting user to spam the page or attempt to circumvent the social networking system filters. Facebook has actually admitted conducting several experiments on users to test how well they could manipulate people by making changes to what they see in their newsfeed. In 2010, they toyed with 60 million people's newsfeeds to see if they could increase voter turnout in the midterm election that year and concluded that they were able to get an extra 340,000 people to the polls. On their own website, they once bragged about a case study which found that, quote, Facebook as a market research tool and as a platform for ad saturation can be used to change public opinion in any political campaign. They cited the study as an attempt to court advertisers to show just how powerful their platform is and hoping to get them to run targeted ads. Hopefully it's common knowledge by now that Facebook was caught suppressing conservative news from appearing in the trending section back in 2016 and artificially injecting topics into the list to give the false impression that certain stories were organically viral from so many people talking about them. For anyone running a professional Facebook page like mine, whatever we post is severely suppressed and only a small fraction of the people who follow the page will see it unless we boost the post, which is a huge revenue generation generator for Facebook. Back in the good old days, what pages posted was what showed up in people's news feeds who followed the pages, but too many independent voices were having too large of a reach, so the algorithm was changed to favor brand name mainstream media pages. Things have changed so much since the early days of Facebook that it's a completely different platform than it was when it first rose to popularity in the mid to late 2000s. They have been getting increasingly less tolerant of different views and their algorithms hide people's posts and automatically suspend accounts for posting what they deem to be hate speech, which you know is just a code word for something that hurts liberals' feelings or facts that they don't want people to know about, like banning people from posting video evidence that showed Kyle Rittenhouse acted in self-defense. They deemed him a mass murderer and took down any post that defended him until after his trial when he was acquitted. Then they quietly changed their policy on him. Since people like me and many others used Facebook to bypass the mainstream media, gaining a huge reach that rivaled theirs, the legacy media outlets scrambled to regain the dominance that they enjoyed since their inception and began partnering with Facebook and YouTube to make sure that their posts dominated the news feeds of users. In 2018, Facebook announced that they were partnering with CNN, ABC, Univision, and other mainstream networks and began paying them to do special live streams Monday through Friday. Anderson Cooper's Facebook show called Full Circle usually averaged around 1,500 live viewers and lasted just one year. Six months after launching the new live streams for mainstream media, Facebook announced they would soon be investing $300 million into various news organizations to help them boost their online presence. People like me have to pay Facebook to boost our posts so they actually show up in the news feeds of the fans who are following our pages while at the same time, Facebook is paying hundreds of millions of dollars to mainstream media channels to help them get out their messages. The liberal bias is obvious, but goes deeper than most people think. Sheryl Sandberg, who was Facebook's chief operating officer for almost 15 years until she stepped down last year, wrote to Hillary Clinton's campaign manager in 2015, saying that she wanted Hillary to win and would help in any way that she could. Facebook openly plays favorites. The company even put up a huge Black Lives Matter banner on their campus and gives out employee bonuses based on how much they're doing to help social justice, meaning prioritize 
prioritizing non-white people, gender benders, and other queer content. Over the last few years, Facebook has changed their focus from a social network platform to a virtual reality ecosystem, promising to be not just the future of entertainment, but also the place for business meetings and commerce and what's called the metaverse, which is literally exactly like the virtual reality world depicted in the 2018 film Ready Player One. And if you've seen it, you know how that turned out for society. It remains to be seen whether or not this metaverse virtual reality world will take off or be a colossal failure like 3D TVs. So far, things aren't going as well as Mark Zuckerberg thought they would, but he's still putting an enormous amount of money and resources into it, hoping to push humanity closer to the pod people enslaved in the matrix. But that's a topic for a whole other video. If you like my serious monologues like this, then you'll love reading my book. So order the Liberal Media Industrial Complex in paperback from Amazon.com or download the ebook from Kindle, iBooks, Nook, or Google Play. My books are a lot more in-depth and hardcore than my videos, which I have to tone down a bit for obvious reasons. So head on over to Amazon.com or click the link in the description below and check them out.